do the same one. Yeah. Let me just move on to global warming. We have two more topics, and I'm conscious of the time, so I hope you don't. Uh, I'll, I'll just rush a little faster through this. Uh, yes, global warming is real. It's uh, man-made. It is an important problem. It's a significant temperature rise. Uh, again, there are a significant number of risks, millions of hungry people, billions with water stress, millions with coastal flooding, risk for malaria, and on and on. Uh, I think there are two points to remember. Uh, if you actually look at the negative effects, most of the negative e effects will come by the end of the century. So we're mostly talking about global warming being bad by the end of the century. Actually, economic estimates indicate that global warming right now is a net benefit. But remember, that's mostly because it's a benefit to rich countries, where it's a disbenefit to poor countries. And rich countries, by their nature of being richer, count more in these economic estimates. So it doesn't mean it's morally the right way to think about it. But it's certainly important to say this is mostly about the far off future. Second is, no matter what we do, and the new I, uh, IPC uh, report made that very clear, no matter what we do, it'll really only affect what outcomes we get in the second half of the century. So again, the choices that we make on climate change matters only in the second half of the century. So again, it's a very long-term uh, issue. Uh, again, we looked at a lot of different solutions. I'm just going to uh, pick up three. A uh, carbon tax that will actually get us to the two degree uh, centigrade limit, the one that all politicians talk about, but which is probably uh, uh, almost ludicrously impossible to get to. I'll, I'll show you uh, why in just a second. Uh, make green energy cheaper through innovation, essentially a research and development solution, and geoengineering. Now I'll just go, uh, uh, go quickly through, uh, but as you can see, there are lots and lots of other uh, uh, adaptation of the carbon taxes, forest technology transfers, methane, black soot. There are lots of other uh, solutions that also have cost and benefits. Uh, so these are just the three ones. Uh, do we have them up there? So, so I just want to make sure that you have all three solutions on, uh, available on, on your, uh, on, on your uh, uh, priority pad. If, again, if you get too many solutions, just update it one more time. So the two degree limit. If you just simply run it through all the climate models, sorry, the climate economic energy models that are out there, uh, they're all uh, organized by something called the uh, Stanford Energy Modeling Forum. Uh, there are 12, sorry, 11 uh, globally recognized models. Uh, six of them actually say we can't make the, uh, the two degree limit. There's no way we can do that by now. Uh, so it's only the five optimistic ones that we've run on and basically saying, what would that need to do? It would require a $250 uh, uh, per ton of CO2 tax now, rising to about $4,000 by the end of the century. Uh, just to give you a sense of proportion, that means we'd have to have about 66 cents uh, per liter of gasoline. And by the end of the century, we'd have to impose almost $7 uh, per liter of gasoline. Uh, which probably indicates this is not something that's going to be politically very attractive. Uh, also remember, this is not just in, in rich, well-meaning England, uh, sorry, the UK where we'd have to do that, uh, but also in China and India, uh, where a lot of people just simply wouldn't be able to pay these uh, numbers at all. So again, this is probably fairly unrealistic, but I brought it in there because it's one of the things that a lot of uh, politicians say. And this, again, most economists would say is the most efficient way to get to the two degree limit just simply by having a carbon tax. It would reduce temperature increase from 3.5 degrees, which obviously a lot of different models, but probably the average around uh, 2100 to about two degrees. And that's, of course, by design. Uh, it would be hugely expensive. The estimate says that it would cost about 13% of global GDP by the end of the century, about $40,000 billion a year, uh, mostly in lost GDP growth. Uh, and it would do fairly little good. It would do about $2 trillion worth of good by the end of the century. So about 1 uh, 20th of, 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 uh, of the benefit. But remember, because we're paying for it much, much sooner than the benefits come in, the estimate is that the benefit cost ratio is about 2 cents back on the dollar. Uh, this is one of the arguments uh, that we also mentioned very early on, uh, where I have you know, gotten a lot of criticism. A lot of people get really annoyed uh, because I come out and say something that seems very sacred, uh, certainly in our uh, uh, world today, uh, that dealing with climate change is actually an incredibly inefficient way of helping the world. Spending a dollar, spending a pound, and then doing two pence worth of good is just simply not the right way to help the world. Uh, but again, 
What I'm saying is not that global warming is not important. It is. I'm not saying that we shouldn't deal with global warming. I'm simply saying this particular proposal seems to be fairly poor. But that's only one of the three proposals and one of the many, many proposals on how we could tackle global warming. Another one would be to focus on making green energy much, much cheaper in the future, essentially spend a lot more research uh, uh, on, uh, on green energy to be basically get better wind turbines or better solar panels or the many, many other ideas that are out there. Uh, so this would probably tackle global warming in the long run by making green energy so cheap that eventually everyone would want to switch. That would be a much faster and cheaper way to achieve essentially the same thing. Uh, we are estimating, the, 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 uh, the authors uh, believe that you need to spend about $100 billion per year. Remember, this goes outside of our budget restraint. Uh, and in some way, you just simply have to say, well, you've got to scale that back because we didn't have that much money. But they're saying that it's also scale uh, uh, irrelevant. And so in that sense, you can probably say you'd still get about the same benefit if you spent less money. But they're basically suggesting we should spend all of the $75 billion and, and preferably a lot more uh, in order to get up to $400 billion over four years. Uh, and they find that the benefit-cost ratio is 11. And again, as was mentioned before, sure, there's no way this is a true number because you know, there's a lot of different things that go into this. Uh, one is it's compared to a lot of previous experiences on large-scale investments in new research. We have to look across a lot of different areas and then hopefully some of them will actually turn out to be, been, be beneficial. Do we know that this area is the same as all the others that we've done in the past? No. But it's the best that we have. Uh, likewise, of course, is it going to be 11? No. It could easily be 5. It could easily be 20. But it's probably in that order of magnitude. Uh, and so again, it simply gives us a better sense of what would the benefit of that be. And of course, also, it has the added benefit of being about 500 times better than the two degree limit, the $250 uh, per, uh, per, uh, uh, per ton CO2, as I mentioned just before. But again, this is just an order of magnitude uh, estimate. If I can just show you the last one. Uh, is geoengineering. It's something that a lot of people have talked about, but obviously we haven't done anything about it yet. The idea is to basically put sunshades on the planet. Uh, we know that that works because this is what volcanoes do. Uh, if you think about uh, Mount Pinatubo in 1991, spewed up a lot of sulfur, di uh, sulfur particulates in the uh, stratosphere, uh, and it basically came around as a, as a whole little haze around the planet for about a year or two years. And it actually cooled the planet somewhere between half and a full degree centigrade for a year or two years. So we know it works. It's actually done a lot more when, when we had the mega explosions a couple of centuries ago and probably uh, uh, many thousand years ago as well. So we know this works in principle. There's lots of different ways to do this. Uh, uh, spraying uh, uh, sulfur particulates in the stratosphere is one way. Uh, there's also a way of, of making clouds whiter uh, by simply uh, spraying up sea salt in the lower atmosphere and, and over oceans. And we could probably make clouds slightly brighter simply because they would have smaller particulates. And smaller particulates means brighter clouds. They reflect more sunlight. And hence, we get a slightly cooler planet. Now, what they're proposing is not that we should do this, but simply that we should look into how this would do. We could do that with white clouds or sulfur particulates. They're proposing a research program uh, that would cost less than $1 billion per year for 10 years. And basically, it would give us the knowledge, can we use it? Do we actually have a plan B for climate change? It would give us an insurance. If anything bad happens, remember, we can't really use cutting carbon emissions as a way to avoid it. You know, for instance, if Greenland suddenly started melting, it doesn't help that we all stop using fossil fuels, apart from it probably won't happen. Even if we did, we'd still have a lot of warming in the pipe. But we could actually use geoengineering as a way to turn down the thermostat and actually cool Greenland, or if we want it to, cool the entire planet. It would also cost reduce the climate policies that we have, because we wouldn't have to have as stringent climate policies. And so if you look at the total cost, uh, the cost estimate of two, uh, two degree climate policy is about $25 trillion in today's money. Uh, that's about, uh, 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 it both, it both in, involves how much climate damage there is, but also how much policy damage there is. You know, we lower the climate damage, but we increase the policy damage simply because we have to institute these very, very costly policies that we talked about. 
uh, if we deploy some geoengineering to limit temperature at two degrees, even if that has substantial damages, it would probably reduce the total cost some $10 trillion. Now, if you've spent $10 billion on reducing the cost some $10 trillion, the benefit is going to be about one to a thousand. It really isn't more complicated than this. So obviously it's very much a back of the envelope. It also depends a lot on the different assumptions. You can get anywhere from 200 to uh, at least uh, 5,000 uh, uh, back in the dollar in different assumptions. But again, it gives you an order of magnitude impact on what we can do. And again, what they're proposing is not let's go out and do this, but they're simply proposing let's at least have this option so that if we want to, we can reduce the costs significantly. But also, of course, we might find that it's not going to work at all, and then, of course, we can stop having this conversation at all. Uh, this is just about your point on uh, the uh, sunshades. Yes. Uh, and you're saying that you, you can essentially turn down the temperature if we needed to. I mean, I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of the climate science involved. It doesn't actually address the problem of climate change, which is increasing CO2. Increasing CO2 affects the acidification of the oceans, affects the hydrological cycle in ways which you not, don't fully understand at the moment. So just saying that you can stick a sunshade up and it'll have a 1,000 BCR, whatever that means, isn't really tackling the root cause of climate change. And I say essentially, I think it's a bit of a, a null point. Yes. I, I, I totally agree. It doesn't address all the problems with global warming and it doesn't address ocean acidification. I would still say it addresses some of the main problems that we do worry about with global warming, but there might also be big side effects and we don't know. That's part of the reason why they're arguing for, for a research program. You're absolutely right. Um, doesn't it seem a bit strange to stick all of these in the same list when we're talking about global warming, which is a potentially affecting 7 billion people, and child malnutrition, which is sort of 50 million, I don't know the exact figure, but they're very different quantities of people we're talking about. Uh, yes, in the sense that, that you can say, if I only want to focus on things that help everyone, then clearly, uh, then you should only be talking about a very few policies, maybe only global warming. Uh, but I would say what we're trying to do, presumably, is that we want to help the most people the most with our extra dollar. No, so I we're essentially... Having the same VCR for each of these things when one of them's going to affect 7 billion people and one that's going to only affect 50 million doesn't seem... Oh, oh, but of course all the 7 billion have been included in this figure. You know, we have the total, uh, assuming of course all the models actually work as they should, we have taken into account that this has a much bigger potential affected population. And we've taken into account, so if you spend a dollar here, if you spend a pound here, how much good would you do for 7 billion people? But, the, but if, if we believe these numbers, at least if you spend it on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a carbon tax, you're actually going to end up doing less good per dollar spent than if you had spent it on somewhere else. So yes, there are definitely going to be different uh, uh, interactions. But in some ways, that's exactly the point that I at least want to get across, that we want to make sure we don't just focus on things because they have very active PR groups or because there's a lot of people there. Uh, one, one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, 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 big uh, uh, sort of initiatives in the World Bank is uh, the neglected tropical diseases. Uh, the, all the stuff that you don't hear about, all the diseases that are terrible, but don't affect all that many people. Only a couple hundred thousand people die each year kind of thing. And I mean that in inverted commas. But of course, we don't think about that. But if you could help them much more efficiently than you could help 7 billion people uh, with, with the same dollar, wouldn't we want to know? So that, that's really the, the driver of this. But you're absolutely right. We need to make sure that we have included all the benefits from policies designed to global warming, which is going to affect a lot more people, hence should have a much bigger benefit. But the problem is that it's also incredibly much more costly to do something about. And that's really what's driving this, this sort of intuitive result. Um, I think you're misrepresenting carbon tax policy. You seem to suggest that it will be a blanket tax across the globe, and your argument was that um, people in India and China can't afford it, whereas, in fact, no one is presenting carbon tax as a singular solution to start with. No one's suggesting everyone pays the same. Like, the EU works as a separate regional like force. It's already a rele uh, regionalized policy, uh, carbon tax, so I think there's some... Uh, that's not very clear in your presentation. Sure. 
I, I should just say that that's, that's, in a sense, you're arguing we should have presented a different proposal, right? Uh, am I understanding you correctly? I think nobody is suggesting that carbon tax is a blanket tax across the globe, that no one will pay the same, and it's not a single solution in itself. Like, EU already has or is already thinking about like different elements of carbon tax and that will be different to yes. like carbon taxes that go on in China. So there isn't a blanket tax and that's what yes. wasn't clear. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna interpret that as this is a this is a different proposal that we should have put out. Any economist would say, no, you should not have different carbon taxes and we've actually run the models if you only have carbon tax for instance in the EU or in the rich world it's a much less efficient way of of dealing with it than having a global carbon tax that is equal so I would actually argue any economist would say this is the best carbon tax proposal that you could come up with and any other way certainly you couldn't make this uh, two degree limit with just an EU or the US or the EU and US uh, uh, working together you'd need the whole world but even if we looked at a smaller proposal they would say, still say and all the models would confirm this that you'd simply get a, a better a higher cost benefit ratio if you make the carbon tax across the whole world I totally agree with you in print you know, in, in reality it's never going to happen uh, and, and so that could also be one of the reasons why you're simply going to say I'm not going to put in my money here because I don't think it's actually going to work but that's a different sort of argument 